Welcome back to the Latin from Scratch course. I'm assuming that you have already finished the zeroth class, that you have already uh, finished the analysis, translation of these uh, isolated sentences, of this short story about the uh, girls, the uh, stain, the, you know, all of that. And then you are back to continue learning Latin. Okay, so in this, uh, the rest of the first module, if you remember, what you have already studied is the zeroth class. Now we are going for the first class, uh, but this is still part of the first module, uh, which means that in these uh, six next classes, uh, you are going to be learning uh, more about what you already know. Okay, so uh, in the first, in the zero class, you are learning things like super quickly, just to be able to translate as soon as possible, etc., which is uh, perfect. But now we are going to actually learn the things and why the things are the way they are, okay? So, uh, again, I'm assuming that you have already finished all of the things that I said. Um, with that said, let's begin with this introduction. Um, of course, many things you already know, but now we are going to learn more, okay? So, about the Latin alphabet and its pronunciation. The English alphabet, and the one used by most Western cultures, comes uh, from the Latin alphabet, so it is quite similar, no? As you can see here, no? Like, uh, you have the capitals, the small letters, etc. And it's uh, pretty much almost like the English alphabet. But in Latin we have 23 letters, and all of these 23 letters are present in the English alphabet, although not all of the English letters exist in the Latin alphabet. So in English, uh, there are more letters than 23, okay? Uh, but all of these exist in the English alphabets, and uh, they are quite similar. They work pretty much the same in English and in Latin. Uh, we already said some important difference, uh, differences. Now we are going to uh, say some more uh, things to take into account, okay? In classical Latin, there is no letter J, which is only used in outdated or ecclesiastical versions, okay? Uh, nothing wrong with these outdated or ecclesiastical versions, etc. It's just uh, in, the, in the editions, in the texts that we work with, uh, the letter J just doesn't exist, okay? Then, both U and V are actually the same letter. Remember that we said that uh, the letter V, when it appears in Latin, we don't, pronounce this, uh, we don't pronounce it like V, okay? Because this sound, V, doesn't exist in Latin. And remember that we said that V is pronounced actually like W, uh, and actually W is much more similar to U, no? U, wa, wa. No? So if you um, if you look at my mouth, you see that U and then wa, wa, wa. Okay, so they are actually the same letter, U and V. Um, but sometimes U is just U, the letter U, uh, the sound U, and then when uh, we have the letter V, is pronounced as W in English. Okay. And then the letters X and Z are considered double consonants, okay? Because actually the letter X, it is one letter, but it's actually two sounds. Like, for example, in, uh, in English, when we say exam, there is an X written, but it's actually exam, okay? So in Latin, X is uh, KS, okay? So X, X, X. And then the letter Z, which in Latin, again, it's only one letter, but it's pronounced dz, dz, like, for example, uh, Italian pizza, pizza, okay? In this Latin course, we will be using the so-called, as you already know, pronuntiatio restituta, which is the one that linguists have reconstructed for the classical Latin. It is different from the traditional English pronunciation for Latin and also from the ecclesiastical Latin pronunciation, which you might hear in many other countries or movies, etc. Okay, so... I already said, for example, no, that um, here, that the letter C, and we were uh, saying this, no, that in the traditional English pronunciation, this would be just like Cicero. So you pretty much are reading uh, this Latin name 
uh, in English, Cicero. Okay, so of course, this, this is Latin, like Cicero himself didn't say Cicero. Uh, he said Quiquero, Quiquero, okay? So, uh, and that's pronunciatio restituta, which we already said that is the uh, classical pronunciation. But uh, I don't want to repeat myself, so let's continue. Vowels, semiconsonants, and diphthongs. The Latin vowels are only five, A, E, I, O, U. And notice that A is A, it's not A. E is E, it's not E. E is E, not I. O is O, not O. And U is U, not U, etc. Or A, or whatever, okay? A, E, I, O, U. Just like that. And then these five vowels can be either long or short. Uh, for now, you don't have to worry too much about this, okay? Um, but just so you can know what we are talking about, think about the difference in English between feel and feel, okay? So this is long E and this is short E, okay? Feel, feel, okay? They are two different uh, vowels, they are two different sounds, okay? So in Latin, we each, with each of these vowels, we have the short version and the long version, okay? But for now, you don't have to worry about that. On top of that, both E and U can be either pure vowels, so E, U, or semiconsonants. Think about, in English, yes, yes, yes. So this is like um, when E in Latin is a semiconsonant, it's like English, yes. And then uh, remember what we were saying between uh, about U and V, okay? So uh, when U works as a semiconsonant, it's pretty much like uh, will, like uh, the W in English, okay? Okay, so before I continue, uh, what is all of this about, about vowels, semiconsonants, etc.? If you remember, at the beginning, we were talking about letter E and letter J, and we said, in our editions, in our texts, uh, the letter J doesn't uh, exist. And then we were saying that U is the same as V. Okay, so now we are uh, explaining exactly how this is the same, okay? Uh, because of course it's not the same, but uh, we are explaining all of this, okay? Anyway, also this is not super important so far. You don't have to uh, worry too much if you don't really understand completely what I'm explaining, okay? But they are semiconsonants, that is, they work as yes and will in these two basic contexts. At the beginning of a word, followed by a vowel. So for example, uh, what in English, we write Julius, Julius, in Latin, you write it like with E. Okay, so here we have Julius, Julius. And then, for example, this V, which sometimes you can also uh, read just a U, but, um, but it's the same, okay? So in this context, at the beginning of a word followed by a vowel, this is read, of course, not as validus, because V doesn't exist, but as validus. Like in English, imagine that it's like this, validus, okay? And then between two vowels, Okay, so always that we find, uh, every time that we find, uh, for example, this or this between two vowels, so again, it's like this or like this. So this would be something like oum, and this is a yekit, a yekit. And these two rules we can actually summarize in this one rule. E and U are semiconsonants when they are at the beginning of a syllable and immediately followed by a vowel. So, I mean, if you uh, check here, it's uh, pretty much the same, uh, but this is like uh, summarized in one rule. Then, we continue. In classical Latin, we have only three diphthongs, and you already know that uh, these three diphthongs are pronounced uh, as it seems. No, like, I is I. So, it's not I, even if um, in many places they say that this is pronounced I, no, it's not I, it's I, A, E, A, E, I, I, not 
I, no, I. Okay, then uh, here, the same. It's not really oi, it's oi, oi, oi. And then this is au. Okay, so uh, no, no problem here. Any other combinations uh, of two vowels is a hiatus. A hiatus is pretty much like one vowel and one vowel together, but they are not in the same syllable. Okay? Even if in English or in Romance languages, like for example Spanish, that which uh, you might know, they are diphthongs. Okay, so these are the only diphthongs in classical Latin. Now we have to talk about accentuation, that is, in what syllable the stress of the word is. And now this is um, because, for example, if you know Spanish, you know that, uh, for example, if you say camión, and there is this uh, acento here, which clearly indicates that the accent, the stress syllable is here, camión, okay? It's not camión, for example, no? But in Latin, uh, there are no acentos like in Spanish, and there are no like these marks, uh, and yet, uh, of course, the words have a stressed syllable. So how do we figure this out? Okay, so on the one hand, it's kind of easy, but on the other hand, it's easy if you know the rules. <laughs> okay, so let's see the rules. First rule, they can only be stressed either on the penultimate or antepenultimate, which means that imagine that we have a, um, a word with three syllables, no? like for example, let's say a, mi, cus. Okay, so three syllables. That's quite easy. Okay, so this the last syllable is never stressed, so it can only be stressed either here or here. Okay, so this is penultimate, this one, or ante penultimate, which is this one, this one, never. So of course. Uh, how do we know? Okay, we know that the last one is never stressed. Okay, but how do we know when it's the this or this? Okay, so for this we have to look at the length of the penultimate syllable. Okay, so we are starting with the weird stuff, kind of weird stuff at first. Later it's not so so hard. Okay, so uh, let's go back. So for example here, no, we have a moris. Oh, for example, here we have mi, li, tes. Okay, so we always check the penultimate. So if we start counting from the last syllable, like let's uh, imagine again, no, like these three syllables, uh, we start counting like this, one, two, three. We said that this one, no. So in the second, in the second syllable, which is penultimate syllable. Okay, so if the penultimate syllable is long, which we mark, with this um, line here, the penultimate syllable is automatically stressed. So, for example, amoris. So, we have to check this syllable here, we have to check this syllable, and depending on whether the uh, second, second counting from the end of the word, no? So, if the second is long, then it has the accent, it has the stressed. And if the second is uh, short, which we mark with this, no, like with this uh, symbol, no, like this, then uh, it is not stressed, but the stress goes in the previous. So that's why we read amoris or milites. So, of course, the question, how can we know if a syllable is long or short? Because in texts, we don't have these symbols. So imagine that I just give you mi, li, tes. How do we know the length of this syllable? Okay, so that is the question right now. Okay, so there are uh, many times, not always, but many times uh, where, when we can uh, know if a syllable is long or short. So a syllable is long when it contains a diphthong. So for example, in grai, ki, i, remember that we said that I is a diphthong. Now, so for example, if here we have grai, so this syllable is long just because it has a diphthong. Okay. Another example when a syllable is long 
if the vowel is immediately followed by two consonants or a double consonant. Uh, remember that double consonants are X and Z, okay? So for example, here we have ostis. So here we have a vowel followed by two consonants. So then this syllable is long, automatic. Or for example, here we have U followed by X, which is a double consonant. So automatically this syllable is long. And on the other hand, we can know when a syllable is short if the vowel is followed by another vowel. So, for example, in Graecia, now we have, I mean, before we were focusing here, and we said that it's long because it has a diphthong, now we focus here, and we know that it's short because it's vowel followed by vowel. So, automatically, this is short, okay? So, these are the things that we can know, like when long, when it has a diphthong, or long when there is a vowel followed by two consonants or double consonant, and then uh, short if the vowel is followed by another vowel. But then, of course, uh, there are many, 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 many examples, many uh, situations in which none of these situations, I mean, none of these uh, things happen, okay? So, we cannot know the length of many syllables just by following these rules. So, we have to check the dictionary. We just have to uh, look at the word in a dictionary, and uh, there in the dictionary, they say the length of the uh, syllables, the, the vowels, actually. Okay, so for example, here, amicus. So we cannot know, okay, the, we cannot know the length of this, uh, uh, of this vowel, of this syllable, because uh, none of these things is happening. So we cannot know. So how can we know? We look the word up in the dictionary, and then the dictionary says that this is long. And then here, also, this is long, because the dictionary says so. And here, this is short, again, because the dictionary says so. And just to finish already with all this accentuation thing, we also need to take into account that the same word, depending on its case, remember, we were saying rosa, rosam, rosai, all of these, no? Can change its accent. So, for example, this, which is nominative, is amor. But then, this, which is the genitive, is not amoris, no, it's amoris, okay? Uh, we will be learning these things uh, when we study, in this case, the third declension. Then there are also unstressed words, which in like this uh, linguistic jargon are called proclitics and enclitics. Okay, uh, here you don't have to really learn so much of these things, okay? Uh, pretty much the only thing that we need to actually learn is this, okay, enclitic. We skip proclitic because nobody cares. The enclitics. Enclitic words are those which are supported by the previous word, not only in pronunciation, but also in spelling. Also in spelling, this is the important part. And they are much more important. So, for example, here we have this que, we pronounce this que, which means and. Then we have this we, which means O, uh, this is not super common, and then this ne, which is just like an interrogative particle, like it's marking that uh, uh, a question is coming, no? So, for example, um, let's focus mostly here, okay? So here we have puer puelaque, and here we see this que, and now we translate the boy and the girl. But you you see that this is here. No? This que is here, but we translate it here. No? So, puer, the boy, and the girl. And the same with puer puelawe, it would be the boy or the girl. And then like with this interrogative uh, particle, it's just like, for example, when isne, are you coming? And um, that's it. Uh, but again, just remember this one. This one is the most important one. And then you might have noticed that uh, if we read this word alone, we said, uh, we say, we say, puella, puella. No, with the accent goes here, no, puella. But here we say, puellaque. Okay, so when there is an enclitic, 
the accent always goes right before the enclitic. It doesn't matter the original accent, the accent uh, which matters with the enclitic is this, no? like right before the enclitic, which is pretty much what I say here in this other part. And before finishing uh, with this last uh, section of the first class, I want to say that I know, I'm aware, that this first class is kind of boring. First, because it's, it's boring, it's just boring. And then, like, too much information, which is not super useful, etc., etc., I know. So, first of all, thank you for watching this class until here. The next classes will be shorter, uh, more fun, more useful etc. Okay, but now let's already finish and be done. Okay, classification of Latin words. Quite similarly to English, Latin words fall into one of two groups. Inflectional, like words which change, we already studied uh, declensions, no? Like, again, uh, rosa, rosam, rosae, etc. No? And uh, inflectional words, words which change, are nouns, adjective, pronouns, and verbs. And then non-inflectional, they don't change. Prepositions, conjunctions, adverbs, interjections, and particles. What are particles, by the way? <laughs> because uh, this is like kind of not a super linguistic word, but uh, a particle is like, for example, this, not like all of these super small words which don't really have any specific translation, but still they exist. So we just say, oh, this is a particle, okay? Uh, okay, uh, that's it. Notice, you, have, you already know this, but notice that in no place here do we have article, okay? There is no the, there is no a uh, in Latin, okay? Because you already know that Latin doesn't have article, okay? Uh, now, yes, we have finished with this first class. Let's go to the second one.